the speaker in extremists. Can Kevin McCarthy gain control of the House? Do you believe the government is going to shut down? Yes, and it's Kevin McCarthy's fault. A very strange and dysfunctional week on Capitol Hill as Republicans fight among themselves about government funding and many other things as well. Then... Ukraine will be yet another endless quagmire funded by the American taxpayer. Ukraine's president visits Capitol Hill looking for weapons and support, but some people aren't buying his arguments. Plus... The nomination is confirmed. The Pentagon is finally allowed to fill key positions, but only because the Senate has figured out a temporary way around Tommy Tuberville's chokehold. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewans with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening, and welcome to Washington Week. So the question on my mind this week, or one question at least, is this. Why would anyone want to be the Speaker of the House? I, I get it, there's great health and dental, and you never have to look for a parking spot, which in Washington is a big deal, actually. Uh, but the job sounds like pure misery. Uh, for instance, here's what the former speaker, John Boehner, looks like in retirement, and here's what Kevin McCarthy looks like. So I, I think you get my point. Capitol Hill unhappiness, unhappiness that's rooted in rules and behavior so arcane that most normal people have a hard time understanding what's happening, means that the government might lose its funding soon, and it also means that great matters of war and peace, including Ukraine's attempt to defeat Vladimir Putin, get caught in the grinding gears of legislative branch dysfunction. So many questions. To give us the answers, I have three very smart people here with me. Steve Inskeep is the host of NPR's Morning Edition and the author of the forthcoming book, Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. Vivian Salama, a reporter for The Wall Street Journal. And Manu Raju is CNN's chief congressional correspondent and starting this weekend, the new host of Inside Politics Sunday. Congratulations on the... Thank you. Listen, Thank if you, you need Thanks. advice on, on hosting a show, I've been doing this for five <laughs> weeks. And so I am, I'm it's here... It's going great. I'm, I'm here for you. I got a lot of accumulated, <laughs> lot of accumulated knowledge. Manu, I want to I start with you. But before we even start, I want you to watch a brief video clip of War Correspondent in Action. Let's put that up. <laughs> Well, you accuse my change you, of position. I never changed my position. You, you don't play for 12 well, days ago. You know what's interesting? You know, so you don't care about any of the answers. I'm just asking about your words. Why did you change your words? Okay, well, let, let, me, let me answer your question because I answered it every single day. You could answer it every single day. <laughs> so you that's guys. That's a daily occurrence. You guys, you guys seem close. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, first of all, what was that about? Yeah. Second, Am I wrong or am I overstating the case when, when I think that Kevin McCarthy is just having a pretty miserable time trying to be Speaker of the House? It's very difficult right now. That specific interaction was actually, I believe it was last week's story, although it's kind of all blurred together, right. when he they moved forward on the impeachment inquiry. Remember, just days earlier, he had said publicly they would have actually have a vote to actually initiate the impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden. And he changed his mind. He didn't have a vote, and he wouldn't explain why. So I was trying to ex ask him why you changed your mind, and he just simply wouldn't do the it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But look, this has been the story of this Congress for Kevin McCarthy, and this is why they spent so much money to try to get in a big majority in the last midterm elections, and they failed to get a big majority. Now, if he loses votes, four votes, or five, he can only afford to lose four Republican votes, and any party line votes... Those five members who want to give him fits, 
can give him fits. And the problem is being a Republican House Speaker in particular is that those members on the far right, they don't care what their leadership says. They, they march to their own beat. And as a result, you're seeing them tie him up in knots as they are pushing a whole host of measures on this spending fight. And McCarthy has made the calculated decision. He needs to keep the government open by getting Republicans on board and passing a Republican-only bill out of the House to try to force his way with the Senate and negotiations with the Senate, rather than moving on a bipartisan approach in the House where he can get Democratic support. Why? Because one of those members, if he goes the Democratic route, could seek a vote for his ouster and push him out as Speaker. And that is really what's driving his calculations here as he struggles to keep the government open. A quick follow-up for you. Does Kevin McCarthy make it a full year as Speaker? You know, it is it's a day-by-day day for him right now. It really is. And this is the thing. I expect a vote as soon as next week, initiated by Matt Gates to call for his ouster. At that same point, five members, they vote no, they can, they can kick him out. But he is not, he says he's not going to go anywhere. He's going to grind it out like he did in January. Right. Can he win? We'll see. Is Matt Gates actually in charge of America right now? I'm just marveling at the timing of that vote. Is anything else going on <laughs> yeah, in the next few days right. that Congress needs to do rather than decide who is Speaker of the House? I don't think Matt Gates is in control of anything particularly, uh -huh. but he has a lot of media attention, and in this circumstance, he has leverage. Um, I mean, the simple thing that... that, that I mean, it's, it's a simple truth that apparently is eluding people. In politics, you need a majority. In Congress, you need a majority. McCarthy has not accumulated one. Uh, Manu has pointed to the place where you would go to get it. You would have to go to Democrats, but has decided that the price is too high for him, I guess, right. at the moment. Anyway. Yeah, Vivian, I mean, the, the, the question is, are we definitely heading toward a government shutdown? Well, as we sit here, lawmakers have packed up and are heading home for the weekend. They will not be back until Tuesday. They have only a few more days left to negotiate. If by midnight on October 1st, the parts of the government that need appropriations bills do not have approval, we're going for a shutdown. And right now, I mean, based on everything Manu just said, it's not looking good. Yeah. Right. Manu, come, come back to this question. Uh, I, I'm just so interested in this. Uh, the, the, the speaker's job in better circumstances, if he had a bigger majority, would be doable? Or is there some culture shift that that is permanent. Yeah, I mean, look, I think after the 2010 midterms that really ushered in this new Tea Party wave of members in the Republican conference, those were the members who simply did had a much different view of government. As McCarthy himself said earlier uh, this week, these are some of the members who want to burn the place down. They simply don't believe in the institutions. They don't care what their leadership says. And they're the ones who drove John Boehner from the speakership by making that same threat, a motion to actually kick him out of the speakership, which is why he resigned in 2015. Now with that narrower majority, is much very, very difficult because... Those members that he needs to keep in line are just not going to listen to him here. Um, and what, is there anything he could do to get them to listen? He's tried everything. I mean, he has literally tried. I mean, he's, he has tried to keep the government open with a short-term spending bill for a month that includes everything they asked for. But there are a handful of members who say they're just not going to vote for a, a short-term bill to keep the government open no matter what. So he said there are about seven of those. So he can only lose to lose those four if right. he goes along party lines, and therein lies his conundrum. Right. And correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but there's I'm no happy to do that. Yeah, yeah and you have in the past, so <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we'll continue. The it, the Senate's not going to buy whatever the Congress winds up selling them anyway. There's no way. Of course, senators are talking. Mana's reported about this. Uh, senators are talking about passing their own resolution first. Normally, they would wait for the House to act first. But they're not going to accept whatever the House passes. This is, in a way, symbolic. Yes. Even if they passed a bill, it's not going to be the law. That's absolutely right. They're going to spend all this time on a bill that's going nowhere. And the Senate, the challenge for the Senate, is such a slow-moving body. One member can slow it down. Right. Rand Paul, who you showed earlier, is planning to slow it down if its ad includes Ukraine aid. So it could take all week next week just to pass the Senate bill, and then they got to figure out how to get it through the House, and that is a huge, huge question. Steve, Steve raises a point that, that's kind of infused with a bit of existential ennui. If it's not going to go anywhere and it doesn't mean anything, why are we even talking about it? 
Is that the question you're putting? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's for the. That's I mean, for our second hour. I, I guess you can say it's part of the process. I mean, even mm -hmm. a bill that that doesn't become law maybe sets the parameters for negotiation, but that presumes then that it, you're it, willing to negotiate. Yeah, and it's a political argument because yeah. they can say we passed a bill, pass our bill, keep the government open, and they'll eat, scream at. It's Schumer, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, right. for not passing a bill. So it is. But if they don't pass anything, then it's it is very clearly their fault that the government right. shut down. Vivian, let's talk for a minute about another aspect of Capitol Hill dysfunction. Tommy Tuberville's holds on Pentagon nominations or Pentagon promotions. Um, this week, kind of figured out a little bit of a maneuver to get a couple of folks, the, the some of the key personnel. Uh, in their permanent jobs, but give us give us a sort of state of play. Where is this right now, and why does Tommy Tuberville, uh, freshman senator uh, from Alabama, why does he have so much power over the entire promotion system for flag officers, for general officers in the military? This has been a thorn on the side of the administration since day one, but particularly in the last few months, where you do have uh, Tupperville uh, essentially trying to push back and hold out. This is something that has happened in the past also with other lawmakers, including Ted Cruz. Um, who but never with, never with uniformed but, officers, right? But never with uniformed yeah. officers. And this is something now that the administration has been going out there and really trying to attack him to say, you are endangering the national security of our country. So right now we are at a point where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley, is on the verge of retirement. And finally, finally they were able to push forward partially because Chuck Schumer and others were said, said enough is enough. We need to make this happen. And so they are going to push forward with at least uh, C.Q. Brown, who mm -hmm. you showed earlier, he's, uh, he was the head of the Air Force, and now he's, he's the presumptive next chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But there are still uh, dozens hundreds. and dozens. Yeah. There's about 300. Uh, hun yeah, uh, hundreds. Thank you. Thank you. Hundreds more that are still up and waiting. And there doesn't seem to be any movement on that. But, but it doesn't seem like the administration is gripped by this as as a primary concern. There, there seems to be somewhat of a lackadaisical effort to try to move Tuberville off this. Well, you have to ask what the administration can do. I think this White House likes to approach problems that they can actually deal with, and they also do try to do things behind the scenes. But self-interest, in a way, works against them, because Tuberville is using a power of holding nominations that all senators have. It's a tradition. It's a custom. Uh, any senator can stop a nomination for, for a period of time, or apparently forever. And mm -hmm. if they were to overcome that in Tuberville's case, they would be losing their own, they'd be throwing away their own power to do that at a some point. And I've asked Tuberville many times about, what, what will it take for you to back off? And it's really one thing. He wants the Pentagon to change its policy to provide reimbursements for personnel who seek abortions out of state if their procedures banned in that particular state. It's really nothing short of that. And, you know, in some ways, Schumer's hands was, was forced this week mm -hmm. by Tuberville, who is going to use a rare parliamentary procedure to try to schedule the votes on these individual nominations himself. Schumer had resisted having those individual votes because he believed giving in, doing that would be giving in to Tuberville, wanting to simply approve all of them in one block. But because Tuberville took that maneuver, Schumer preempted him and moved forward with those handful of nominees here. So the and question is, what's going to happen for the other And he got some flack for that, because they yeah. said, why did it take you so long, then, to move forward exactly. and do that? Right. Can you, Vivian, just stay on the subject for one more, one more turn. What is the impact on military readiness? Of Tuberville's actions, extraordinary. Uh, you know, and this—it's—it's—it's it's, it's not just about military readiness. It's about the impact on the families of these military these military families who don't know where they're moving to next month. They have to put their kids in school. The school year just started, and they don't know where their next posting is going to be. I mean, the list goes on and on. Obviously, military readiness is something that is very, very important in terms of putting people in certain bases and 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 you know, essentially executing military policy in that way. But the impact on the families is so yeah. significant, and that is something that weighs heavily on the military as well. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but these officers, uniformed officers, aren't the people who make these policies that Tuberville is objecting to in any case. Of course not. Of it's course a Biden not. administration yeah. policy. They, they're very much victimized by the whole back and That's forth. That's got to be part of the frustration. How would you mm -hmm. like to be stuck in this way and know that you had nothing to do with it to begin with? Of course. Yeah. Right. Um, Steve, 
Yes. To be fair, <clears throat> I did try to book Abraham Lincoln on tonight. He wasn't available, so yeah. we got the next I'm best. The we got the next best thing. <laughs> this is your book, um, and it's it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, the 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 question for you is, and I and I ask this in seriousness. You spent a lot of time studying how Lincoln, yeah. in a very polarized Washington, got people to uh, uh, compromise and got people to agree with him when they disagreed. Uh, what would Lincoln say if he were the Speaker of the House today? <laughs> what would Lincoln do? And by the way, this is, this, is, you, this is non-refutable. You can say anything you want because he's want. not going to comment. It's a counterfactual. It's hypothetical. Yeah. I think there are a few things that I learned from studying Lincoln that do apply. One is what I said before. A majority matters. You need to build a majority. And Lincoln was not practicing the kind of politics that I think we recognize today. Base politics. Playing to your base. Playing to your uh -huh. most extreme members. Trying to grow the extreme wing of your party. He was reaching over to other people to try to build a majority. He wasn't trying to agree with everybody. He ended up being the president who fought a war against another part of the country. So he wasn't getting everybody onto his side, but he was trying to keep a majority on his side. And he sometimes crossed party lines to do that. He changed parties himself at one point to do that. He also uh, this is pertinent to McCarthy's situation, was willing to step aside for the good of the cause. Mm. There was a Senate race in 1855 where it was a vote in a legislature to be the next senator, and he realized he could not do it for his side. He couldn't get the majority for his side, but another guy on his side could, and he stepped back and let that other guy become senator. That's a thing that you can do. I don't know that McCarthy actually can do that. Who else would be speaker? Yeah. That may not actually be a relevant question right. here. McCarthy might be the most reasonable, the best possible choice to be speaker right now, for all we know, given that we don't know what the alternative would be. Right, right. What, what are the, when, when Abraham Lincoln did that sort of selfless act, selfless political act, uh, was that com more common in that age, or was he just an oh, uncommon? Oh, no, plenty of selfishness in, in, in that age as well. <laughs> well, understood <laughs> that, but um, was, that, was the, that an extraordinary manifestation I, of this it, man's it character? It was impressive. He also was a far-thinking guy. He was just getting engaged in building this new party, the Republican Party, incidentally, um, which was an anti-slavery party. He wasn't even formally a Republican at that point. Um, and he was, in stepping back, getting a win for the cause, defeating his rival who was on the other side in that particular battle, and he was also building up credit for himself in the future. He was running for the Senate, he lost that seat, he gave it to somebody else, but then he became the party's nominee the next time around. Mm. Um, and he was aware that uh, people acted out of interest mm. and self-interest, and that he had self-interest as well, but he tried to align that with a higher cause, which is something that he did in that mm. case. Uh, let's talk about Talk about somebody who uh, we all know, I think all of us have interviewed him, uh, president of Ukraine, President Zelensky, uh, who actually admires <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln quite a bit. <clears throat> and I'm sure he's I, said we that. We didn't discuss that. I would have handed him the book. You, you know, you could, you missed an opportunity there. <laughs> I seriously there. thought about this. Yeah, no, you okay, should. I'll you, send it to him. You should, <laughs> just, yeah, send it to yeah. Kiev. Um, president Zelensky shows up in Washington. It's not like the last time. There's no joint session of Congress. Yeah. Uh, there are people who uh, aren't uh, as interested in funding the Ukraine war as they used to be. Uh, Vivian, let's start with the visit itself. Was it, from President Zelensky's perspective, successful? Well, it, it was the day after, if you will, because today, on Friday, he, it was announced that he was going to get ATACMS. The ATACMS are the long-range um, missile systems that he right. has been asking for all along and saying Best that acronym. is going to be... Best yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Weapons. Yes, exactly. Sorry, it is. It is it no, is they spend a, a lot of time <laughs> coming up with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what sells attack? Exactly. And so on Friday, it, it seemed apparent that the Biden administration, after months and months of hesitation, was finally going to, to to agree to that. And that, for President Zelensky, was a win because that was something he believes right. would break this stalemate, essentially, that is occurring on the battlefield right now in Ukraine. So for that reason, it was. Right. But also, uh, enthusiasm in Washington is waning, and that was very apparent. And that, for him, is something that's alarming because this war is not ending anytime soon, and he needs to know. He wanted to leave here with assurances that he was still going to have America having his back. One quick thing about these processes that we've now witnessed for quite a while. The administration starts by saying, the Ukrainians are never going to get X. And then the next week, they get X. 
Could you explain why we've seen this over and over again? I, on one of my visits to Ukraine, I had a, a very senior general who would tell me, you know, the Americans are really slow to respond, but when they do, it's like lightning. Mm -hmm. And that is something that they have seen versus the, the British uh, government, for example, that just sends and sends, very re reacts very quickly, and a couple of others. But the U.S. weapon systems are essentially the best. There's no, nothing better than them. The U.S. Right. has given more weapons than any other country. And so they can't afford to alienate the United States, but there is frustration, and especially because the big offensive that we've been waiting for this entire year is really moving slowly. There's a high rate of attrition, and they're taking back very little territory. We right. still have the Russians holding a land bridge over the Black Sea, and that's very dangerous for them. Right. Ma Manu, how popular is the Ukraine cause on the Hill? Yeah, I, I think it still has wide support. The question is, does it have enough support, the right support, meaning yeah. the Speaker of the House? It's really, the, that's what it is. Because if you get to put it on the, for a vote in the Senate, you'd probably get 75 votes, maybe 80 votes. It's going to pass easily. You saw the bipartisan showing with Schumer and McConnell next to Zelensky walking through the Capitol. That was a very obvious. Mm -hmm. On the House side, if it was not McCarthy and Hakeem Jeffries walking along with Zelensky, it was just Jeffries. Now, McCarthy is because he's he is facing pressure from his right flank, folks who don't want to spend a dime more, the same people we were just talking about. And that is what it is driving his handling of this. And if he doesn't want to put this on the floor, it won't get on the floor. Right. What would McCarthy do if he were just following his conscience? Yeah, he, I think he would get behind Ukraine. He was there and he was very supportive of this. Look, this could be a big flashpoint in the government shutdown fight. Chuck Schumer told me yesterday they want to add it to the bill to keep the government open by the end of this month. That would force McCarthy to make a decision right. on this issue. And by right. the way, Jeff, I don't think that, you know, we talk about Donald Trump and whether or not he would come back and that, if that alarms the Ukrainians. I'm not entirely convinced that Donald Trump would reject sending more aid to Ukraine. It could just be political rhetoric. Remember, Donald Trump was the one who approved javelins, another kind of weapon system that the Ukrainians were desperate for when the Obama administration said no. Right. I Steve. feel that one way to read McCarthy, and you'll correct me, um, is that he is trying to bring support behind the cause of Ukraine. And the, there was a kind of drama in the last several days where he says, I have questions. I have serious questions for Zelensky. And then he uh, met Zelensky and walked out and said, oh, he answered all my questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be part of a process of building support. Speaking of which... You interviewed Zelensky yes. this week. Mm -hmm. Did he answer all your questions? Uh, he responded to all my questions, yes, which is a slightly different thing, but I enjoyed the conversation. Tell <laughs> us the, 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 the highlights and, and answer specifically, specifically oh. how worried is oh. he about Congress? I, he is worried about Congress, and in fact, it's related to the story we just told. McCarthy had questions about how U.S. money has been spent. Zelensky, of course, is over in Ukraine and is aware that there are these concerns in Congress that this is one of the questions that's going to be raised. How are they spending American money? And this first time there was a whiff of corruption in their defense ministry, they let go of the defense minister, who was very powerful, and Vivian knows all about this, and got rid of a number of top people, other top people in the defense ministry. Uh, Zelensky then comes to the United States and is able to tell Kevin McCarthy that. McCarthy walks out of the meeting with Zelensky and says, hey, he's really on top of things here. He got rid of all these defense ministry officials. In our interview, in talking about that specific incident, Zelensky said one reason we have to be on top of corruption immediately is because otherwise we will lose the support of our partners. So he's changing personnel in Kyiv with a mind to keeping Congress on board. Right. I want to um, just read a quick quote from Mark Milley, who I interviewed quite a bit over the last several months. It's, it's a fascinating quote about the centrality of the Ukraine cause. Um, we, the Americans, are the primary authors of the basic rules of the road, and these rules are under stress, and they're fraying at the edges. That's why Ukraine is so important. President Putin has made a mockery of those rules. He's making a mockery of everything. He is making a direct frontal assault on the rules that were written in 1945. Based on all of your assessment of where the Republicans are, or for that matter, many people in the Democratic Party, do you think that the Ukraine cause can be sustained over the long term? Because as you note, and you've been plenty of time in the battlefields in Ukraine, going on offense is hard. Yeah. And, and the, it's a, it could be a long slog. Give me your, in the last minute we have, give me your very quick assessments of of, of the staying power of this issue. Zelensky said he thought the hardest part of the war was over. Um, 
my feeling is closer to yours, that it's hard to see how the hardest could be over at this yeah. time. And look, and I, I think that on the Hill, that the question is how much more money will the U.S. have to commit to this? And that is one area of concern that this $24 billion, even if it is improved, how many more tranches of cash will the U.S. ask for to help Ukraine? Can that get approved? All huge questions. Right. Vivian, last word to you on this. One of the things I hear from Europeans all the time is that we don't know what the future is going to be for Ukraine. And so right now we want to help them, but we also fear for the future. There could be a government change. Something could happen that could really change the face of Eastern Europe. And so there's a lot of eyes on the situation, but it's going to take a long time. It's a fascinating conversation. Very, very smart people. Thank you very much for doing this. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Um, but I want to thank our panelists for joining us and for sharing all your reporting. You could read excerpts of Steve's new book, Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. Uh, and actually, you could read it on theatlantic.com this coming Monday. Um, and also, thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, on tomorrow's PBS News Weekend, driverless taxis, are they the way of the future or a dangerous idea? I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular. This is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.